Hi, I'm Blake Van Thoff of Blake Builds. We're here at my race shop in, right outside Atlanta, Georgia. Today we're going to talk about installing my fire suppression system inside my E92 drift car. For Pro-Am rules this year, you need to have a fire suppression system. So I got one, I installed it, and this whole video is going to be in Papadakis Racing style of doing videos. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, check it out. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. We've been doing these videos for about a year. The E92 is really getting close to having most of the components all done and uh, almost all of the fabrications done. And we're installing some very serious components in it and hoping to, hoping to have it done for the 2021 season. So the first thing we had to do is figure out where we were gonna put everything. And I decided right here is where I'm gonna put the tank. Then to do that, I have to make a cover for the lines here and I have to cover these lines here with my cool shirt bracket. First thing we started off doing is CAD work. So, you know, Stefan Papadakis loves to do CAD on the computer. We're doing some CAD of our own cardboard aided design. I'm pretty sure it's basically the same thing as what he does. So I just cut up some cardboard and taped it up with some uh, painter's tape to get the general shape and idea of what we we're gonna make to cover these lines up. And it's just like any other cover. I mean, I just cut it out of aluminum and bent it up. I always like to think the more time I spend on the cardboard, the less time I'll have to spend on the metal since cardboard is much easier to cut and work with. It's just really easy to get the general shape you need before even touching any metal. You can see it fits almost perfectly. I just gotta cut the corners off there and we'll be good to go. Back in action here, fits perfectly, ready to go and trace onto the metal. So I had some leftover scrap aluminum around, you know, aluminum looks nice, you don't really have to paint it, it looks good enough and uh, it's really easy to work with so I traced the cardboard onto the aluminum. So I went ahead and got the most dangerous tool in the shop which is a electric handheld shear. I say this is the most dangerous tool in the shop because I always think it is. If you somehow slip or get your finger caught in there, there is there's no time to save it. It will just chop it right off. Cuts through this metal fairly easily and uh, it makes it really, really quick. And then for the corners, I just use a pair of tin snips. Since this is thin enough aluminum that I can just cut the corners out with tin snips, makes a nice enough cut and uh, I'm gonna bend on those areas anyway so you won't even notice. Here we go, we got the cardboard piece all set in there in the right direction. And we try to do a cool snap transition and uh, it's upside down. So snap transition didn't work, but the metal piece is all done and it up in the garage. Just got to mount it, so I just drill a couple holes, figure out what size hole I need for the rib nut. Drill it in and the rib nut fits a little loose. I like to use these step bits because they're really fast, but you know, the hole that it makes for the step is kind of loose, so it seems to work okay. I just put it on the riv nut gun and went ahead and riv nutted it in. They make lots of different types of these riv nut guns. They make this kind of big one here, which works really well. It's pretty standard. They also make like 90 degree ones and uh, kind of even at Harbor Freight you can get a really cheapy one, but it never really has the right bits and I really wouldn't suggest it. Now that all the rib nuts are in, I can go ahead and place the cover back on. And I'm actually using the cool shirt bracket for the upper cover. So the cool shirt cooler actually goes in this area as well, if you guys remember. And I decided that the bracket would make a good cover for those lines. And I had planned this out a lot earlier in the, in the build. But uh, the cover worked nicely. And you can see we just screwed it in with some nice Allen head button bolts. I like to use Allen heads in situations like this, especially on the interior, just because they look nice. They look nice, they have a small profile, and if you get them in stainless steel, they don't rust. So you can see I'm just screwing down the bracket. I screwed it down loose to begin with to make sure that all the holes would line up and everything and now I just go back and tighten it all. 
I was pretty happy with how this little cover and bracket system kind of turned out. It looks pretty nice, it's pretty strong, pretty stable, and uh, I think it'll suffice for keeping the contaminants from underneath the car from coming into the car. Now we gotta check and see if the cool shirt actually fits in there. Yep, no problem. I mean, it's made by CoolShirt, but I use a different cooler. And CoolShirt gives you these cool little straps, which is much nicer than the ratchet strap that I had in my E36. You can see the lines come out the back and go down into where the driver would be to plug into the CoolShirt itself. Those straps keep the cooler in the bracket at all times. And you can still open it even with the nitrous bottle right there. It's not a real nitrous bottle yet, but it will be soon. It's just a dummy bottle. But you can see it's pretty easy to access the ice inside the cooler from the window. Next thing we had to do was figure out where we we're going to put the fire bottle. So the fire bottle is actually really, really heavy. And it's probably, I mean, maybe like 20, 30 pounds. And, you know, we got to figure out where the brackets are going to go, how it's going to fit. And I wanted to put it right here on the passenger side because of its weight. We have a, a small city going on right behind the passenger seat now. And uh, I kind of decided that it was going to go right behind the cooler itself. And to do that, I had to modify the brackets a little bit. So the new kind of tube or, uh, hose tunnel uh, kind of caused some issues. So I had to modify the brackets a little bit to fit it around the, that hose tunnel. And uh, once I did that, I was able to rib nut the brackets on. They specifically tell us to use 8 millimeter bolts for these brackets. So I used 8 millimeter rib nuts and uh, put eight millimeter bolts in there. And you can actually see that I had to bend the bracket to fit on top of that tubing tunnel that we made because uh, the fire bottle actually isn't wide enough to clear all of it. So I kind of modified it all a little bit and bent the brackets a bit differently and got the fire bottle sitting where I wanted it. The other problem I ran into was that I had to put these brackets about an inch lower than I originally wanted to because behind that firewall there's a tube uh, that goes between the two rear strut towers, so I had to lower it about an inch. But we got the brackets on. You can see I just slid the bottle into the oversized hose clamps that they came with, and I was able to get it hung basically exactly where I wanted it. And unfortunately, when I went to test the cooler again, because I had to move it down an inch, you can see the outlets of the cooler, cooler actually go straight into the fire bottle. And uh, that won't clear. work. Those are dry break fittings, so even if I leave them disconnected from anything, they won't leak water. So I'll just drill some fittings into the back of it to fix that issue. The next thing I did was I routed the whole pull cable system. So to activate the fire suppression system, there's a pull cable which goes all the way to the driver's side A pillar. Formula Drift rules say it needs to be on the driver's side A pillar and within 12 inches of the window. If you place it here, you only need one pull cable instead of two, but you can put two in there. The pull cable I used was a little bit short because of the location I chose for the fire suppression bottle. So I had to make this kind of like extender bracket deal. And basically all it is is uh, one cable comes into one side and gets hooked to another cable on the other side and the bracket itself leaves the um, kind of, I guess it's insulation, but the outer tubing uh, in place so that when you pull it, it pulls on the other uh, cable without moving the outside tubing. And I replace those two screws there with button heads again. Next thing I did was I started doing the fuel system nozzle. So I routed the tube back into the rear of the car and formula drift rules say you have to have a nozzle spraying at the fuel system. This OMP kit came with six nozzles total, so I decided two in the engine bay, two in the driver compartment, and two in the fuel cell area. And the aluminum tubing is really easy to work with and bend. And uh, I just straightened it all out. It comes shipped in a coil. I straightened it all out, bent it all up to fit into this area, and then cut it at the right length to put this little nozzle on here. The nozzle should point at kind of the center of the fuel cell, 
So you can see me working at it here to get a nice smooth bend to have this nozzle pointed at the f fuel cell I, in the orientation that I wanted it to. It's really difficult when you're trying to make these really kind of tighter bends to make them without kinking it, especially when you can't get the little tubing bender that I was using in there. But I got it to work and uh, the nozzle is pointed in the right direction. So this is the tool that I've been using to bend the tubing. It makes a nice smooth bend, doesn't kink it too much. If you do maybe over 90 degrees, you kind of risk kinking it. So if you were to do a 90 degrees, I always bend it in two spots. But I just uh, put it on there, bent the tubing to the angle where the nozzle would point toward the center like the other nozzle did. And then to cut this tubing, you have to use a kind of a, I think it's a plumbing tool, but it's uh, just like a hard line cut tool. And you figure out the length that you want the hose to be. Then you take the cutting tool. And as you tighten it, it tightens a blade down onto the tubing. You rotate it around the tubing and tighten the blade further and further. And it makes a very clean, nice cut in the tubing. This one's actually a pretty large one in comparison to other ones you can get. It's definitely not necessary to use a large one like this for aluminum 3 8 tubing. But it's what I had. I actually have the small one too. I just couldn't find it. So I used this. It would have been easier with the small one because obviously I'm fighting, you know, getting it around the fuel cell in the cage there. You just rotate it a few times. Then the end will fall off and you can actually go ahead and deburr it afterwards. So this tool actually has a little deburring blade on it. So I just run it on the inside to deburr anything that's still in there. And then it's all ready to put the nozzle on. It was a little kind of overbent and actually it's really easy to kind of unbend this tubing in comparison to any other like bigger tubings that you use. Aluminum is quite easy to work with so I just unbent it a little bit and got it pointed in the right direction and then I used all these little cushion clamps with uh, rib nuts behind them to keep the nozzles where I wanted them and keep the line kind of nice and good looking and, and uh, not bouncing all around and stuff like that. It took a total of probably 15 of these cushion clamps and uh, 15 rib nuts. And the lines are all done now so I routed all the lines from the bottle out into the back of the fuel cell area. I used that tool to make all these nice bends around the interior of the car. I hit the driver's side footwell right there with this nozzle. The cabin nozzles can't be pointed directly at the driver or passenger but you can see the passenger one here is actually kind of pointed down and away from the center console. Then the tubing routes into the engine bay and I have two nozzles pointed at uh, both of my headers. So one on one side goes across the back of the bay and then into the other side here. And back here where we were working before you can see the nozzles are pointed right at the fuel system. So all in all this is a pretty tedious and time consuming project. I decided to make a video like Stefan Papadakis's because I very much idolize him. I like his work. I like his engineering style. I like his video style. And if he does ever see this, I hope he doesn't take it as a uh, kind of a negative thing or a parody. I just like his style, so I decided to try it on my own. Please consider subscribing, hit the like button, and I'll see you guys next time.